Hi everyone, welcome to the third year Fast Tracking Scotland. My name is Omes and I'm programs lead at HIV Scotland. First of all, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. I have here Gillian Freeling Kelly with me. Gillian is the Chief Executive of Positive Help. I have Neve Miller, she works in arts. I have Dr. Victoria Ross. Dr. Victoria is a clinical psychologist specializing in HIV care. And I have Martin Hutchison and Colm Sinclair. Martin and Colm are living wealth specialists at Terence Higgins Trust Scotland. So the topic for today is mental health and well-being. There's no universally accepted definition of mental health and well-being. This is probably because mental well-being may have different connotations for different individuals, groups, and cultures. For some, it may be the notion of happiness or contentment. For others, it's absence of disease. For some, it could be economic prosperity. For others, it's based on the goals sought to be achieved and the challenge is placed on the individual or a culture. It also may mean the absence of negative determinants in the life of the individual or community. Mental well-being includes cognitive, emotional, and behavior responses at a personal level. So what does World Health Organization say is about mental health and well-being? Mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to his or her own community. Today, the risk of mental health issues are three times higher in people with HIV as compared to those who are HIV negative. Many go through shock, grief, anger, and fear when they're diagnosed with HIV. Psychiatric issues can include depression, bipolar disorder, suicidal thoughts or actions, and substance abuse where racism, poverty, transphobia, and mental illness come together, those acquiring HIV are at greater risk. Multiple social, psychological, and biological factors determine the level of mental health of a person at any point of time. However, stigma and discrimination is the biggest contributor to mental health issues of people living with HIV, and myths and misinformation increases that stigma and discrimination. People, face, people living with HIV face self-stigma. They face stigma from their family and friends, in healthcare settings, organizational settings, social care settings, and it all contributes to mental health issues of people living with HIV. However, social isolation that is particularly associated with older people, and it also contributes to their mental health issues. HIV Scotland, provides free well-being services for people living with HIV. We have counseling and therapy. We have life coaching that is for people living with HIV and their family members. And we have some fun stuff that is comedy workshops. So before 
any further conversation, I would like to uh, hand over to Jillian to come and tell us how she, her organization has been supporting uh, people with mental health issues and during this COVID-19 time. Over to you, Jillian. Thanks, Uma. That was a great introduction, actually, and um, sits very well as an introduction to what I'm going to be talking about today. My name is Gillian Freeling Kelly, and I'm the Chief Executive of Positive Help. And I've been asked to explain a little bit about how we responded to COVID and supporting people living with HIV during the pandemic. So I will share my screen just now. So Positive Help offers practical help for people living with HIV, and we have done for over 31 years. As an organisation, we have a person-centred philosophy, and we use trauma-informed practices to ensure the people we work with are at the heart of what we do. And that includes service users, volunteers and staff. And with the team, we deliver four core services supportive transport, where we're enabling people to access, physically access uh, their hospital appointments or other appointments that keep their physical health and their mental well-being. We enable them to remember their appointments, talk through anxieties that they may have about attending a hospital or clinic setting, whether that's during COVID or out with COVID. We also have our home support service, and that was where our volunteers would be um, supporting people in their own home to maintain independent living. And whether that is decluttering or cleaning their home when they may be feeling a bit low or physically unwell or improving their living environment by painting and getting a little bit of encouragement for, for home decoration. It goes into also kind of household management about helping them with bills and managing their finances. And then we also have two of our children's services because we realise that the families, we need to support the whole family living with HIV. And we have our study buddy service where volunteers are matched one-to-one -one with a child as an educational mentor. But we also realise that not all children do attend school. There are many who are not engaging with school currently and we encourage them to with their wider learning. And we also have children and young persons befriending services. And again, that's another volunteer on a one-to-one -one basis, taking that child out to give them some um, external experiences from that family, give them a listening ear and that supportive role model. So we are a small staff team but we work alongside 50 to 70 volunteers at any one time. And our team as a whole is very diverse and we represent the community that we work with. It is so important to Positive Help that we involve so many people with lived experience um, because that is recognised that peer support is so important. And I know there's been some sessions um, the previous days about peer support. Within Positive Help as well, it's so important for us for safety, of course, at all times. But that collaboration, everything that we do involves working together. Working together with the service users, the volunteers and the staff to co-design services, develop services and change services where we're needed. And then it comes to COVID. All of our in-person services had to pause, just like so many services throughout the UK and of course the world now. And what we saw that from the end of February, beginning of March, that people had increased anxiety about using some of our services. So they were stopping and cancelling their, their transport to their hospital appointments because they didn't want to be attending their hospital appointments. 
we've heard that actually the few that did attend when they were seeing um, hospital staff with masks, extra gloves, etc. That was a time that reminded them of when they were first diagnosed and it was re-traumatizing of that stigma and prejudice that they experienced when they were first diagnosed and they may have experienced previously or and since, but since then. Now Positive Help was mindful ensuring that the service users knew our volunteers would be wearing masks for those who were able to continue but um, by mid-March we had to put a pause on all in-person services and of course lockdown started as well which meant that some of our service users couldn't continue what they were doing. But Positive Health continued throughout. We were um, very pleased as a staff team that we were financially stable uh, and able to do that. And the staff team worked throughout and they worked tremendously hard. The volunteers also supported us and continued on the services wherever possible. But of course, the services had to change. We weren't physically able to take people to the hospital, but if they did need that, we were able to provide a taxi with that glass screen and talk through the additional anxieties that they may have. And these were the only um, extreme emergencies that we needed to support with that. But what we found was more and more people were turning to us for our help because other services were at capacity or they unfortunately were paused. We had an extreme amount of calls made and received. Staff were calling people even before lockdown and it really became apparent that more support was needed. Staff were calling our most vulnerable service users on a weekly basis, sometimes two to three times weekly, just to check how they were doing. And it really became apparent that there were a number of worrying issues. And of course that was within all society, not just the HIV community. But there were the additional issues that um, we're aware of with some of our service users and the comorbidities that they're also living with. But the issues that came up was the confusion that everyone felt then. Many of our service users have additional support needs or low literacy. And actually some of the worrying things was they couldn't understand any of the shielding letters they were receiving or any other information they, they couldn't have that, they couldn't understand that. And because their usual support wasn't able to support them, they were coming to us for that. We found just like so many people, there was increased social isolation. And we know of that already within the HIV community, but that was exacerbated during lockdown. Of course, increased anxiety as well. So with the, the increased number of um, calls to staff, we knew something had to be done. And this is where our new phone friends service was started. Our home support usually provided that social support. And we found that because we weren't able to, to physically go into people's homes, we still needed to offer something. And our home support and our transport volunteers quickly changed to calling our service users because everyone, staff and volunteers, are trained to that same level of support skills. So they were quickly able to change that with a little bit of additional training. But we found that within our own volunteers, we were still needing extra people. Our service users were looking for more of a conversation at times that we found would be better suited for a volunteer rather than staff who were then able to actually really support someone in crisis. So we recruited new volunteers, phone friends, we um, trained them online, we um, did everything online of course and over the phone and this was a very successful service. We also got the staples out of course. We already deliver food and medication when needed. We do have a mini food bank ourselves. 
and that was a quick thing to offer that we were able to do before the statutory services were up and running. And that was really when um, our services were needed most, the first few weeks when government parcels and pharmacies weren't delivering. But it was a reduced number of volunteers for that as well, because some of our volunteers were shielding themselves. But we have now delivered over a thousand days worth of food, and that is still counting. We are delivering our holiday hampers now, and that will be two weeks worth of food to the most vulnerable people who need it at the moment. And from evaluations, we found that actually the, the phone friends service was a huge benefit to everyone. Of course, to our service users, but also to our volunteers and particularly the new volunteers, some of who were new, completely new to volunteering and they found their own well-being had been um, positively impacted by volunteering with us. So this is very short, um, but what we have found from the evaluation is we've got some learning, of course, but what we are very keen to continue on to um, support people's physical and mental health in the future is to start Phone Friends as a separate service. There are some changes that we need to put in and some additional training that we need to put into the, to, uh, the programme the comprehensive program for the volunteers and that will really be around supporting people's mental health but we will be continuing also with our other service with the additional safety protocols and further developing other services to support people's mental health and that's for both the service users and volunteers overall looking back through the pandemic and through covid positive felt was very lucky because of the organization that we are we are a small organisation and we know our service users and our volunteers and within the staff team very, very well. And it's based upon relationships. And all of the, the, the positive um, kind of well-being, um, kind of self-care uh, points are involved in everything that we do. And that was just really encouraged during lockdown. If anyone does have any questions I, of course I can ask uh, answer them at the end but if anyone is also interested in volunteering with us we will be um, recruiting new volunteers in the new year for the new phone friends service thank you very much thank you Gillian for such a great presentation and for such a great work um, I would like to hand over to Neve who's going to talk about beyond traditional support, thinking of well-being. Over to you, Neve. Hello, sorry, I was unmuting myself then. Uh, my name's Neve, and during lockdown, well, lockdown one, I took part in Age of Scotland's comedy workshop, and I'm going to give you my impression of the love lady from Twin Peaks. And I wish I could see your faces because I'm actually joking. This is literally just a poster tube. Ironically, it does contain branches, but that's another story. And we will come back to the poster tube. So yes, my name's Neve, and four weeks today, I will be 45. And in March next year, it'll be 10 years since I was diagnosed as HIV positive. And that bit is important. In March next year, it'll be 10 years. And as we all know, in March this year, the world stopped or at least it felt like it stopped. Lockdown one was pretty terrifying. We had no clue what was happening. There was this new danger that was a threat to us all. We had no clue what was going on. What would it mean if we caught COVID? What if we already had it? What if we had it and passed it to somebody else? I mean, would we die? Because there was no cure. And this, this sounds familiar because it sounds an awful lot like HIV. And I'm not talking about back then, I'm talking about now because there are people here in Scotland and the UK and all over the world that are pretty clueless as to what HIV actually is. And when I just said about COVID being a new danger that's a threat to us all, does that sound familiar? 
John Hart said that in the UK government's HIV AIDS health campaign of 1987. You know, those infamous tombstone and iceberg adverts. We've not had an advert since. Now, we know that HIV aims beyond us, like all of us here. Who else knows? There's people that are out there that have HIV and they don't even know they have it. And there's people out there who have HIV and they don't know that things have changed. But even if they do, they can't always tell anyone else about it because sadly, stigma isn't undetectable. Sadly, stigma is all too transmissible. Horrible and terrifying and seemingly always there. When you start a new job, you tell your boss, if you make a new friend, you tell them. When you start a new relationship, and even when you open the paper or the browser to be more technically adept than myself, and you see yet another story that's riddled with the disease of lies and misinformation. I mean, it's no wonder so many of us live in isolation pre-COVID, especially when you have a daily reminder. Some days, medication is just medication. An alarm pings, you knock back your tablets and you go right. But other days, the reminder is just that. So you snooze the alarm and just have 30 more minutes of peace. That iceberg advert is actually inadvertently a brilliant metaphor for HIV. We all know it's there, but there's so much more going on underneath the surface. And there's so many different areas to address and to reach. And I feel for you guys as professionals, I really do, because it must be impossible to know where to start. But we all have to do what we can to chip away at that iceberg. Now, normally I hate origin stories. There's essentially three ways to get HIV. Sex, transfusion, needles. Do we really need another origin story? Well, I think we do, because actually they are all different. And hopefully some of them can help shed a light on an area that can be improved. And can you guess what's coming next? Yes, it's my own origin story. Make it brief though. In June 2010, one Wednesday morning, I woke up with a sore throat. And by evening, my throat was so sore, I couldn't finish my meal. By Thursday morning, I couldn't talk. And by Thursday lunchtime, I was in hospital. I was given two choices. I could stay in the hospital and have an emergency tracheostomy or be moved to a different hospital and put into a medical coma until they could work out what was wrong with me. But there was a proviso with that, that if I chose to go to the other hospital and be put into a medically induced coma, I could die en route. So it was an easy choice. Lads slit my throat. And so they did. And I have a small scar around about here somewhere. That's really only noticeable when it's very cold outside today. But I was given no reason as to why any of that had happened. Just, it's a miracle, off you go. Now, obviously, we realise that that's probably just past the point of zero conversion. But I wouldn't get a diagnosis until the following March, which was nine months later. It wasn't, and it still isn't, standard practice to test people, especially in unexplained circumstances in a hospital setting. And that can't be right. That was 10 years ago. But although apparently now, if someone is diagnosed as late stage HIV, hospital staff are giving training to consider testing. We all want generation zero. We all want everyone to know the status. We all want everyone to know the status and be on medication. We all want everyone to know the status, be on medication and be undetectable. And I know there are a million starting points for all of this, but we really do need to normalize HIV. Not terribly funny, all of this, is it? And I'm here to talk to you about the common workshop. They were a lifeline. Uh, talk about pressure though. Like what if you weren't funny? And what if you said something to other people with HIV about HIV and they just went, what? But it wasn't like that at all. It was really great to connect with other people who just got it. Most of them were people I've met before, but didn't know very well. And let me tell you, by the end of it, I know some of them a little too well, but that's, I'm not gonna go any further with that. We met every Friday night and my work had also decided to do a social on Zoom, which meant to connect us because obviously we're all at home. They were dreadful. 
and they only connect with us in their awfulness. So apart from anything else, it was a great relief to get out of doing those. And while the work Zoom would loom, and it would be such a soul crushingly horrible way to end the week, comedy workshops were a complete joy. And ironically, we didn't spend that much time talking about HIV, but it was so free and to know that if we wanted to, we could. And somehow, somehow, it was always Friday again. We all remember what it was like in lockdown, how long the days felt. I was on furlough. Obviously, it's a strict lockdown. I was seeing one person once a week in the actual socially distanced way. I don't have Zoom. I'm not great with technology. And it was pretty lonely. I live on my own. And, and again, I know we were all in the same boat. I've had mental health issues for decades now, but I'm really lucky. And 99% of the time, I can spot my own warning signs and know how to keep myself healthy and safe. But not everyone can do that, especially if they're experiencing mental health issues for the first time. And we all know that HIV can not only be an, a factor in experiencing mental health, but poor mental health has led some of us to getting the virus in the first place. And that's why it's so important to reach out in both ways. HIV charities and organisations and positive people like myself. When I first heard about HIV Scotland, and it really was, but it was so much more than that. It really was a lifeline. As I said, Fridays just appear again. Sometimes I wouldn't have done my homework though. I know, I know, we actually have homework. Comedy is a very serious business. Some of you may have been there back at the start of the HIV AIDS crisis, when you go into work and there'll be a fax from America telling you about some new discovery or perhaps something that didn't work. Or perhaps responding to your fax about something that you've discovered or something that you discovered didn't work. It's all pretty primitive by our current uh, technological standards. Look at us all on this crazy Zoom. Who knows what the future holds? Who knows, maybe we'll have those holograms like in Star Wars. And then some of you really will have to wear something proper and not pajama bottoms. And you know who you are. Now, I didn't have a laptop during the first lockdown and my phone wasn't great either. Trying to do Zoom, Zoom on a phone is a nightmare. You can't prop it up and turn to it. You can't hold it at arm's length. It's, you can't get it at half decent camera angle, frankly. So I used my poster tube. It's an elastic band to hold the phone in place. A little lit ledge to pop, uh, pop the phone on to. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes you would get an extreme close up, which no one wanted, frankly. But I had to make do with what I had. I had to just muddle along and get on with it. And that's not really acceptable for people living with HIV. We can't just muddle along and get on with it. We need to reach out because reaching out makes things so much better. Those comedy workshops, as I've said a couple of times, I think, really were a lifeline. They really helped especially in the dark times that were early, early lockdown and COVID. So many things have changed with HIV. We need to let everyone know. We need to let everyone know HIV has changed. We need to bring everyone with HIV together into the light. Thank you. Sorry, I was I was mute there. Um, thank you so much, Neve, for sharing your experiences with us and also making a smile. Um, I would like to uh, now hand over to Dr. Victoria Ross, and she's going to talk about providing dedicated mental health support to people living with HIV through pandemic. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you um, for the introduction. I'll just share my slides here. Um, hopefully you can kind of see them. And 
Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this event. So many kind of interesting talks and thank you, Neve. Um, yeah, also for the smiles and Gillian to hear about your service. So um, I work yeah, in NHS Grampian within HIV and sexual health, and I'm also a, a faculty member for the British Psychological Society's Faculty of HIV and Sexual Health. So um, Umas, Gillian and Neve, you know, set the scene really well for what I'm going to talk about, thinking about from um, kind of mental health care perspective. So in the time um, in my presentation, I, I want to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the landscape of services over the last year um, and some of the adaptations and challenges that have come because of COVID. Um, and, and maybe kind of zooming in a little bit on the, um, the kind of unique factors that COVID brought to people living with HIV, that some of which have been already mentioned. Um, and then kind of thinking about our, our new normal and how we move towards that and what that might look like for us um, as well. So setting the scene, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's already been done really well um, by um, Umas, Gillian and Neve. but we already know pre-COVID, um, you know, what the landscape in terms of mental health looked like, you know, Neve mentioned this kind of bi-directional bi -directional link between HIV and mental health and we know that people living with long-term conditions in general are especially more vulnerable to experiencing mental health difficulties. And not only that, uh, the mental health difficulties are usually or can be more persistent. Um, what's more is we also know that there's a low proportion under 40% that seek help. Um, and those that do, about 90% are offered medication as first line. So these figures are really quite kind of staggering in terms of the, you know, the services that are available or utilised. Um, and we also know that integrated mental health care, so HIV specific care rather than generic services really offer um, and, and meet, you know, the, the, the need of people living with HIV. So just a, a kind of very brief overview of the adaptations and challenges from um, a kind of psychological care point of view within the NHS and, and um, kind of COVID. You know, like some of the other services, there were some significant and quite rapid changes in terms of service delivery. Um, so alongside all other acute um, medicine clinical care, psychological therapy was delivered remotely. Um, now across the country, um, within psychologists working within different services, um, there was some variability. So some services were completely halted and staff were redeployed um, to other um, kind of essential services or staff support. Um, and there was a real kind of focus on essential services. So as kind of Gillian mentioned, you know, it was a really difficult time where, you know, the, the needs were, um, they kind of changed or the, the services changed, the needs necessarily didn't change. So it was a real kind of challenge at that point. Um, we also know that there was also some kind of increasing uh, initiatives. There was lots of creativity from services. You know, Positive Scotland spoke about them earlier, how people adapted. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Positive Scotland was HIV specific, but there was a lots of services that, that weren't. Um, we also noticed a reduction in referrals to psychology and um, there's some kind of varying thoughts around why that was the case. Um, certainly, I think as a, a nation, there was a sense of um, kind of wanting to kind of ease the burden on services and not really knowing um, how COVID was um, impacting healthcare. Also, you know, the kind of change to remote consultations and um, focus on essential services might have meant that um, kind of emotional health was perhaps missed in some cases. So I guess thinking about the adaptations and the challenges, you know, of course, you know, there, there's kind of two sides to, you know, these challenges and the adaptations. And it's quite interesting to consider both, both of these. Um, what we found and what we have found over time um, is that for some, 
um, the kind of move to remote um, delivery offered people an opportunity to engage again in healthcare that perhaps haven't done for, for some time. Um, and that may be due to multiple reasons, um, you know, digital health kind of suiting them better, offering more flexibility, um, but also perhaps the practicalities of reducing kind of health um, travel costs and, um, you know, kind of travel time. You know, we, I think we've heard a lot about kind of stigma and actually digital healthcare perhaps can reduce the stigma associated of, um, you know, going to clinics or, or hospitals for some people that have, you know, quite distressing kind of memories associated. Um, for some people, there is also a, a kind of increased in motivation to understand their condition in the context of COVID and understand the risks um, for them as well. Um, and again, we mentioned the creativity of services. So actually having a broader range of services, albeit perhaps brief and, and not always specific, was there was some something available. On the other hand, you know, I think we can't hide from the fact that actually there was a lot of reduced capacity. You know, for some, there may have been postponement delays. And for people living with HIV who perhaps have developed relationships over, you know, either fairly recently, over many, many years, that perhaps that kind of rapid change might have kind of built feelings of loss and abandonment. We know that, as already mentioned, that um, the increase in kind of, um, kind of anxiety and depression um, kind of, you know, was heightened and also the kind of digital divide, you know, whilst digital health offers lots of opportunities, we know that it's, um, you know, not far reaching across society. Um, and again, practicalities to um, kind of safe space and, and risk to confidentiality. I'm not going to go through all of these um, individually, but um, and some of them have been touched touched on before. But just thinking about the specific um, kind of factors that people have been talking about in terms of COVID nineteen and, and their mental health, um, I think Gillian mentioned. You know, for some people, the kind of re-traumatization or, or memories of, of a very difficult time, and Neve mentioned a lot of kind of parallels into, in terms of what we're hearing. So that can be really tricky lockdown itself um, you know as humans we really strive and um, thrive on structure and routine and actually that's really been kind of thrown out the window for many of us so things like medication our, our kind of regimes it's been much more difficult um, and, and of course kind of isolation you know the the way that we usually cope with stress you know the the kind of tools or, or coping resources have been you know, really significantly reduced. So, you know, what we found that people have been reporting increased um, kind of high risk behaviours and coping um, mechanisms because of the disconnection and loneliness um, that kind of restrictions and, and the lockdown has kind of brought on. Um, we also know that, you know, this kind of, as we spoke about, changes to services, the uncertainty and, and perhaps confusion around what it means for for people as an individual or services again you know kind of come back to two sides of the, the same coin and and a, a however um you know for some people i think i, I want to stress that you know there's been no right or wrong way to feel and actually how people have been have responded has been highly variable and you know we all have very different circumstances even within this um scenario so yeah it, i think we hear people saying we're in the same boat and yeah you know we're maybe we're in the same storm but in different um circumstances circumstances so some of the interesting things that people have spoken about is that through this lockdown there's this kind of collective sense of isolation um so that people feel less different and connected with society on a whole which is really interesting um, you know, for some people feel a little bit more equipped because there's been more in wider society around managing feelings of, of isolation. 
Um, for some, lockdown has taken away pressures to relate um, kind of socially or um, with kind of sex and relationships, which has been quite freeing. And also kind of lockdown as a bit of a, an equaliser. So this idea of being kind of in the same boat and in, in the same storm. So, you know, with that in mind, you know, we as we move towards the new normal, um, you know, we're not going to go back to the previous landscape. And of course, there's elements of the lockdown or these last um, kind of eight months that we have a lot to learn from. So how do we define, you know, what is the new normal for services for us as individuals? Um, you know, how do we be very um, aware of the emerging distress? So we know when we have um, high levels of threat for which, uh, would be totally understandable through this pandemic. It's after that, when things start to subside, that we start to process what's happened um, and then we might start to experience higher distress. So how do we um, be aware of this, be aware of the importance of relationships and repair? So when services you know, have had to make changes, how do we kind of repair some of those ruptures and, and build those relationships back up? digital communication. It's amazing that we can all meet here today on Zoom um, and over the last few days. How do we keep up with advancements in communication and, and be really creative and, and thinking about how we reduce the digital divides so that we can increase um, support? How do we integrate support, keep that support that's um, kind of appropriate for people living with HIV? Um, you know, thinking about all the fantastic work that Gillian and her, her teams have done and, and Neve and Comedy, how do we support services and teams um, as well who are supporting people with um, people living with HIV? How do we move towards um, thriving, you know, thriving and living with HIV? So thank you for listening. Um, I'll be around for questions as well. And my email address is there if, if anyone wants to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Victoria. I mean, we have got some great insights into uh, the new digital platforms and how some new questions as well that how can we, for example, include people um, who are not probably comfortable with the digital platforms and how the inclusiveness you know, that was the very main message in your um, presentation. So um, now I would like to uh, introduce Martin Collum. Uh, they are going to talk about supporting the well-being of people living with HIV during COVID-19. Um, over to you, Colum. Helps if I unmute myself. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Callum Sinclair. And good morning, I'm Martin Hutchison. Uh, we are both Living Well Specialists at Terence Higgins Trust Scotland. Uh, and some of you will be aware of our project, Peer Support Scotland. Our colleagues, uh, Julie and Billy presented on that on, uh, on Monday, which provides opportunities for skills development as well as group and one-to-one -one support for people living with HIV and or hepatitis C. And over the last three and a half years, we've been working with our service users and incredible peer volunteers to build confidence, resilience and capability together, making meaningful connections between peers, services and community resources. Up until March this year, a lot of that work was done face to face at our centres in Dundee and Glasgow with pop-up workshops and training throughout Scotland, as well as ongoing local group meetings. The well-being outcomes and benefits of in-person peer support come across as being particularly highly valued in our user-led evaluation from last year, motivating people to leave the house and share in activities with peers in a, a welcoming and safe space. At the start of this year, as reports started to circulate about coronavirus and its uncertainty, anxiety set in, and we knew our team, our peers and our service users would face a crucial test of our work around self-management, resilience and well-being in a crisis. Little did we know that in March, all but one of the project's frontline staff would be furloughed, leaving only myself to provide targeted assistance to people living with HIV and or other bloodborne viruses who found themselves struggling as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, by August, the rest of the team had returned 
um, to share the workload. And I have to say it was very thankful at that point, but it did enable us to um, produce more groups, one-to-one -one support. Um, we changed our group timings, so we offer groups in the afternoons, evenings, and even weekends. There are, con there are key considerations around the medical, physical, and financial well-being of, of the people we do support. Yeah, uh, with the coronavirus measures set to continue for some time to come, uh, and as several areas in, in West Central Scotland move to the highest uh, level of restrictions, we know that the additional support requirements uh, still need to be met, all of which, uh, as, uh, as our co-panellists have discussed, um, are intrinsically linked with living well and improved mental health outcomes. Um, as a specialist service at THC, we're able to provide, we're able to address the specific health inequalities uh, and, and the barriers to accessing support faced by people living with HIV, which our, our co-panelists have so powerfully illustrated this morning, um, including uh, concerns around stigma and discrimination uh, and cultural sensitivity. Uh, we can also help to build capacity uh, through collaborating with partner organisations. Um, so here's some of what we have been doing. Uh, recently. Um, so with the support, oops, hang on, let me just, there we go, oops, the back one. Uh, with the support of the Scottish Government's Communities Recovery Fund and Connecting Scotland Digital Inclusion Initiative, together with further COVID relief funding from the National Lottery Communities Fund, uh, we're able to continue this work until the end of March 2021. Martin? Hello, I'm sorry I can't, uh, there was a break in, the, in, in my connection there. Um, so as Callum says, these are some of the things that we do offer. We are able to provide practical assistance in Greater Glasgow and surrounding area during level four coronavirus restrictions, including delivery of essential medication from hospitals and pharmacies, emergency food supplies, provisions of other necessities, such as hygiene, sanitary and sexual health products, assistance with fuel poverty, particularly for those difficulty with prepayment meters. This was equally crucial for our peers or service users who were in shielding. Uh, yeah, we were also able to train up digital champions and provide Chromebooks, iPads and 12 months of free internet access to isolated or digitally excluded service users through the Scottish Government's Connecting Scotland initiative. Um, a further offering uh, is our walk and talk, socially distant support sessions for those who are unable to engage remotely uh, or would prefer some form of in-person contact. So it's an opportunity to engage face-to-face -face in a safe way. Here are the details of a remotely delivered specialist support um, available across Scotland. So we offer enhanced one-to-one -one emotional and mental health support, regular wellbeing check-in calls, expert financial and welfare advice, resilience building group activities on topics such as food security and employment, development of personal recovery plans, introduction to appropriate practical support offered by trusted partner organizations and connection to peer support and other wellbeing services. These lists are not exhaustive and our services intend to be flexible to the requirements of an unpredictable situation. Uh, so our next steps will include uh, further collaborative work, specifically supporting the mental health needs of our service users. Um, as you can see from this graph, we've had a recent upward trend in the number of interactions we've had with people who are accessing our service, specifically discussing uh, negative impacts of the pandemic and lockdown measures factoring into depression and anxiety, uh, as well as feelings of isolation. So as you can see, over the summer months, they settled down somewhat, but it's crept back up again as we headed into winter. Um, we are gonna leave you with um, some words um, from some of our uh, service users uh, to kind of amplify their voices. Um, I feel guilty asking for help when there are others worse off than me, but my anxiety is out of control at the moment. It's not the virus, either virus that scares me, it's how people's minds get warped. 
I am homeless, I have been diagnosed with cancer, I have HIV, and I am worried about corona. I'm too scared to go outside now. Worrying and praying for my child's health and the whole world. I miss hugs. These aren't quotes from the height of the lockdown in spring. They're from the, over the last six weeks. And with an uncertain future ahead, we are doing all we can to make sure the people who access our services can live as well as possible. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin um, and Colum. Um, we have some questions here. So let's go towards the questions. Um, yeah, so the first question is, is there culturally sensitive support available for black and minority ethnic people living with HIV in Scotland? Um, Martin and Colum, maybe you would like to say something about it? Um, I want to make particular mention of the organisation Penu Health. Um, again, a partner organisation that we and HIV Scotland, Waverly Care, Positive Help, we, we've all been collaborating together and, and working together. And I think we all recognise uh, how important that it is that we you know, we don't work in silos. Uh, Penu um, do fantastic kind of targeted work around um, supporting uh, black and ethnic minority, uh, particularly African communities uh, with regards to uh, HIV and, uh, and mental health support. Yeah, and I would also like to add that HIV Scotland also has, uh, you know, diversity of uh, psychologists and counselors available. So um, if anyone needs help uh, from our uh, minority background so they can easily come and ask for the services. Okay, so let's go to the second question. Um, excellent presentation, Victoria. You mentioned that referrals to mental health services has declined during COVID due to redeployment. Do you know where the services are expecting a higher proportion of people needing mental health services once capacity is back to normal, will there be a bottleneck effect? Yeah, so it's a really good question, and I'm sure one that, that many is kind of pondering. So um, in terms of the, the referrals, I guess, you know, there are multiple factors which have impacted, you know, people accessing services. Um, for the second wave, a lot of services have kind of gone back to capacity. We're, we're still kind of finding that way, although it's kind of digital. Um, but to answer your question, in, in, in what we know about um, kind of crisis and trauma and how um, our, our kind of bodies and minds respond, that it's when we go back to safety, you know, when we go back to, and, and in this case, it's our, our new normal, when we get there, that actually we start to process um, the kind of changes. So we would, um, in terms of thinking about the mental health kind of, um, you know, fallout of the pandemic, expect that, you know, we are starting to kind of see that certainly with the second wave and the, the kind of fatigue, um, the winter, there's lots of factors. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, we need to kind of think about services and how we prepare um, and to kind of, you know, offer people the support that they need. Um, and that's, yeah, obviously kind of especially important for people living with HIV, but, you know, kind of wider for people living with long term conditions. Yeah. So, um, Victoria, do you, do you think that we have uh, that particular support for uh, people living with HIV, uh, a separate sort of support that's just dedicated to them? Yes, yeah. So as I kind of mentioned, there's been a lot of work done, which has looked at, yeah, kind of genetic services versus specific support. And we know that the kind of genetic services don't kind of meet the need in the same way that the more integrated support. So, yeah, up in Grampian, I'm kind of embedded in the HIV team. I, um, you know, my kind of role is, is within that team and we're very fortunate and people are able to be seen very quickly. Um, and I think one of the next questions about sign posting and I think having these relationships um, across sectors is, you know, is, is so important to be able to, you know, get people, um, you know, the right support that they need at, at the right time as, as, as best as we can. 
Sure. Thank you, Victoria. So um, next question is, um, waiting times can add distress to people needing support. Should the NHS improve its signposting to third sector organizations that provide mental health support such as those here? If so, how could that be done? I think that's kind of, uh, was your answer as well, what you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think the short answer is yes, very much so. And I, and I think as services have been adapting and changing, I think we have a responsibility to kind of know what's going on out there and keep those links so that we, you know, we can, um, you know, move people along you know, where they should be. But um, yeah, I think that's a, an ongoing work in progress, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Gillian, what do you think about it? Like, how can we make sure that people uh, that we approach as well in terms of providing them services um, and we do more towards that um, and people know about organizations like Positive Help and HIV Scotland? So, yes, I think like Victoria said, it is um, obviously it would be great for the NHS to be approaching third sector organisations, but also I think it's third sector and community organisations to be approaching the NHS teams as well. And we're very lucky at Positive Help that we have good relationships because of those 30 years. Um, we've got good relationships with the Western General Hospital, the team at RIDU, the Regional Infectious Diseases Unit, and the Chalmers Centre. And we sit on the HIV care and treatment group within the Lothians here. So we do have those good connections, but I know we can do more as well. And we've been really proactive. We've obviously just had a, a recent team um, with, with your team, um, UBASA HIV Scotland, a team meeting there yeah. to give an update on our services and to, for the third sector to be sharing updates on our services. We had a recent one with Waverly Care as well. So I think it's about people, everyone being proactive at the moment. Um, we know that actually social media doesn't reach everyone, particularly with, with our service users at Positive Help. There's so much um, digital inequalities there. And sometimes it is just a telephone call that is the best way to communicate with people. So we've been calling all our service users who we haven't been hearing from for some time as well and who we maybe lost touch um, during lockdown so there's a lot more work to do I think um, we know certainly there's still a lot of people that we could be supporting and that we're not reaching yet yeah thank you so much Elaine. Uh, so my next question is um, how do we ensure living well works for everyone and doesn't exasperate exciting health inequalities, sorry, existing health, health inequalities. Um, Colum and uh, Martin, would you like to say something? Um, I think a part of it is about presenting like a range of opportunities and different types of support to live well, because that, that does look different to different people. I mean, throughout, there have been kind of conversations throughout the summit around um, how do we measure what it is to live well and um, kind of quality of life. Um, but again, there are so many kind of different ways that like whether it's kind of small steps or whether it is massive kind of changes in, in somebody's um, kind of physical and mental well-being um, that there are opportunities for support there. So I think that it, it it's like what is absolutely crucial is that we are all working together and as uh, Gillian and Victoria have already mentioned there are big I think there have been like massive strides particularly in the last kind of decade of of us working between statutory and third sector um, to to provide as broad and as as a kind of varied uh, a range of different ways for for people to to access support so I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I would just like to echo the, the fact that it's, you know, I think we really need to collaborate, work together now, um, especially, you know, due to the current pandemic and we need to raise so many, many issues. And I think the only way for us all to be successful in what we deliver um, 
and help you know those affected live well to work together with all friends we all you know have so much knowledge that we can share uh, as well as learn but the only way forward is you know to sit down uh, together and work and offer a, a various range of um yeah. It could be mm -hmm. off, it could be many, many sort of things, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much, Martin and Colin. So um I think we're short of time and uh, I have just one last question to ask Neve. Uh, how do we Neve, what do you think? How do we motivate people who say they feel lonely to take up support, services and social activities? both now during COVID and also when things get back to where they can be more fa faced off, yeah. Well, I think um, to follow on the, from the previous question, I kind of, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm going to try so hard. I always put my foot in it. I'm someone who lives with HIV. I don't really find out about any of these services. So I was proactive in a sense, and I went out looking for them. But where does every positive person, where do they start their positive journey with a diagnosis? Where is that diagnosis? It's in a hospital. So there's really an emphasis that the hospital should be directing people like me to these services. And that has, I have to say, that really has improved in my experience over the last, uh, certainly about eight years. Um, so I use the HIV, the My HIV Forum through Terence Higgins Trust. And again, a total lifeline uh, every day. Every day, we get to share, share our experiences with new people. And more increasingly in the last couple of years, new people that have come along have said, our clinician told us to come here. Uh, so it's a great sort of starting point. Um, and that sort of broadens your connections, I guess. That's, that, that was my route in and uh, sort of contacting people and building relationships with various different organisations. But I think ultimately it has to come because it's horrible when you're told, you know, you get diagnosed, then off you pop and, and deal with it. And, you know, the, either the point of a sexual health clinic or in a, an HIV clinic, between the two of those, that should be of dovetailing of where it comes from and spreads out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Neve. Um, so we are almost um, over our dedicated time. And um, I think I would like to thank all of our panelists for such great uh, discussion and uh, giving us some amazing and great insights. Uh, thank you so much, Colin. Thank you, Neve. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you, Jillian. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.